In the meantime, we are going to turn our attention to the upper limb. From the thorax, the vertebral column, the ribs, the sternum, to the upper limb. And this is a brief pause as we make our way down through the body. Uh, the upper limb, part of the appendicular skeleton that attaches to the axial skeleton. We're going to look at the bones, structures of interest, uh, muscles, nerves, blood vessels, etc. as we go through. So we'll do this over the course of this week. Move into the pelvis and lower limb next week and the week after. And if you're keeping track, that's three weeks. We have four left. The last week we will um, discuss the immune system. The immune or the endocrine system? I'm not sure yet. One of the two. But we'll <laughs> devote a week to one of the uh, lesser focused on systems in the body. Maybe the immune system, because that's it's the time of year that you want to talk about the immune system. Flu shots are, are available at Shoppers Drug Mart. I hear a lot of coughs going on in the background right now. Maybe we want to talk about the immune system. You can tell all your friends why vaccines are good. So the upper limb, the upper limb. There are 126 bones of the appendicular skeleton, the upper and the lower limbs. Uh, and the appendicular skeleton largely involved in locomotion and body movement. That's not to say that the axial skeleton didn't move. We saw that it did move. <coughs> The combined movement of all the uh, intervertebral joints allows the spine to flex to a fairly high degree, side to side, forward to back. But the upper limbs are largely involved in locomotion and movement. We have a wide range of motion of the arms and the legs, knees, elbows, uh, the ball and socket joints of the hip and shoulder, etc. And so what defines the upper limbs in this case? Obviously, the arm, the arm, the forearm, the bones, muscles, nerves that uh, travel in and supply those areas, as well as the scaffolding that supports the upper arm. In this case, the shoulder girdle is the, uh, the scaffolding that supports the upper arm and connects it to the axial skeleton. So there are girdles in uh, the upper limbs and the lower limbs, the points of attachment for the limbs to the axial skeleton. So we're going to look at the girdles first, then we will continue uh, distal down through the arm looking at the structures as we go. Now the girdles are not big complicated structures. The pectoral girdle or the shoulder girdle is a U-shaped structure made of two bones, only two bones, which doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not. Two bones and one point of attachment, <coughs> which is kind of striking. The bones in your upper limb are attached to the axial skeleton at only one contact point, and it might not be where you think. So um, girdle simply means encircling or surrounding, and these two bones take the shape of a horseshoe or a structure that encircles the, uh, the thoracic cage. The two bones in question are the clavicle or the collarbone. We've uh, briefly mentioned that in previous classes. And the scapula, which I think we've mentioned before, but uh, we're going to go into depth this class and in this section. Scapula, also, the, uh, also known as the shoulder blade on the, uh, the upper back. And if you think about these two, you see them uh, shown here in the diagram. The uh, clavicle, obviously a bit more anterior. The scapula on the posterior side of the thoracic cage. They connect at one point laterally, and they make this U shape that supports the upper limb. One point of attachment, and we've seen it before. Remember when we were palpating the manubrium and the uh, sternoclavicular joint, and everyone was feeling the clavicle articulate, 
with the sternum. That's the single point of bone-on-bone -bone attachment for the upper limb to the axial skeleton. Where the clavicle articulates with the sternum right here, conveniently at the sternoclavicular joint. And in this section, uh, for ligaments, joints, the names are going to give you the two pieces of the puzzle. Sternoclavicular, sternum clavicle. Those two things are articulating at a joint in this case. So it's not connected at all to the vertebral column. It's not connected at all to the ribs or the thoracic cage. Not uh, connected at all to the cervical vertebrae, the head, any other point in the body. This is the only bone-on-bone uh, -on -bone point of attachment. Yet, your upper limbs are fairly sturdy and stable and secure. They are held together, held in place by large groups of large muscles. And so a lot of our discussion in this section is on the musculature of the upper limb. Bones, fairly straightforward. Lots of cool features that we'll touch on. Uh, but the muscles do uh, the heavy lifting, keeping the upper limbs attached to the body. So let's start with uh, bone one of the girdle, the clavicle, the collarbone. Uh, I think we've even seen this in so much so that you can easily identify this as the right or left. Who wants to give it a shot? Or maybe by a show of hands, who says left? Who says right? Okay, right has it. And right's correct. This is right. The long flat end, the acromial end, always points out. That in and of itself isn't enough to let you know that this is right or left. The long curve, there are two curves, one long curve and one short curve. The long curve is always medial, points backwards, uh, or it's, it's uh, convex, pointing backwards. And another way that I like to identify these is the smooth surface is always on top. One obvious projection on the underside is the conoid tubercle that we'll come back to in a second when we talk about... Um, Ligaments. So long, flat end, always lateral, smooth surface, up, broad, long, sloping curve uh, towards the sternum. This is the right clavicle. And notice anterior in both cases points towards the middle. So the anterior surface of this top one is pointing down, and the upper portion of this bottom diagram is the anterior. It's just the flipped version of the, uh, of the clavicle. So pretty straightforward. The medial end articulates with the manubrium. We know that. We just saw that on the last slide. And you will have seen in lab that the lateral portion articulates with the acromion, which is the, the scapula. We don't know what that is yet in class. The acromion is a word we're learning for the first time. It is a structure or a part of the shoulder blade, a part of the scapula. So not a lot of uh, surface features to pay attention to here. Conoid tubercle, the acromial process, the uh, shape, the general long curves. Um, where the clavicle attaches at the acromion is the only point of connection between the two bones of the girdle. The only bone-on-bone -bone point of connection. There are a few different points where they connect via ligaments. So the uh, acromioclavicular joint is quite stable. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the second bone in the girdle first, the scapula. Probably one of the more irregular shaped bones that we've studied so far. Not a flat bone, although a large portion of it is flat. Certainly not a long bone. Many different projections coming off of this relatively flat-ish surface. An odd shape. Very odd shape. What are some distinguishing features that we can use to um, study the scapula? You're never going to be thrown off by which one is right and which one is left. They all follow the same general formula with the big uh, the spine and the process pointing off to the lateral side. 
First and foremost, where the upper limb attaches is at the glenoid cavity. So the very shallow dish pointing out laterally, uh, not along the flat surface of the scapula, is the glenoid cavity. And we'll talk about that a fair bit as we get into the shoulder joint uh, a little bit later on today. My favorite joint, because mine is inflamed right now, because I always guard it because I've dislocated my shoulder four or five times. Um, glenoid cavity is the point of articulation between the humerus, the upper limb, and the shoulder girdle. If you're looking at that, it's not immediately obvious from the posterior view, but you certainly see it when you look from the lateral side. A lateral view looking back towards the midline, this big shallow dish is the glenoid cavity. Now, the obvious other feature of the scapula is the spine. It sticks out, literally and figuratively, like a sore thumb. The spine you can even palpate. If you reach around the back, you can feel the spine pretty easily. And we use that as a nice border. It feels good also, especially right now. The spine of the scapula uh, separates a few different uh, muscles that help to hold the uh, upper limb and the humerus in place. It provides a nice, um, nice uh, conduit for some different features that we'll look at. Obvious distinguishing feature of the scapula. And at the end of the spine is the acroma, the long flat end um, what might be the wing portion of the scapula that matches the long flattened end of the clavicle is the acroma. It's lateral, it uh, rises superior and projects towards the front, towards the anterior surface of the body. You can see it in three dimensions. It rises from the scapula, points towards the front of the body. The acromion is where the clavicle connects and forms the girdle with the scapula. Not to be confused with a similarly shaped process, the coracoid process, which derives its name, uh, it mostly means crow's beak, and I don't know what, um, what language, but the coracoid process uh, refers to the crow's beak shaped prominence, uh, just anterior to where the, uh, the humerus would articulate. And it's harder to palpate or feel this projection. You can feel the acromion fairly easily. I always follow my clavicle back towards where it meets at the uh, scapula. And if you come back an inch or so, inch and a half, if you were to press your fingers into that opening, if there weren't structures in the way, you'd be able to feel the uh, coracoid process. It's hidden deep under some of the heavy musculature of the chest. So you can't palpate that directly, which isn't unfortunate. It's fine. So I think these are the important features of the scapula, uh, and they result in a couple auxiliary or secondary features that I want to bring up, only because muscles that we're going to discuss use these features to separate them into different areas. The spine of the scapula divides it in two. Two really easily noticeable sections, the supraspinous, above the spine, and infraspinous, below the spine, fossa, which simply means a shallow depression, supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. What's not on this figure that I struggled to put up um, without putting a whole other picture up, you're going to have to imagine on the other side of the screen, if you were to pop on the other side of the screen and then look at the scapula as it's pictured on the left, or if you were way over here on the right-hand side and you looked at the surface that's facing towards the right-hand side of the screen, the subscapular fossa, which as its name implies is below the scapula, between the scapula and the thoracic cage. These are important for muscles of the uh, rotator cuff, for lack of a better word. That help to keep the humerus in place that uh, easily get ripped and torn when you're a baseball pitcher or you've injured your shoulder a couple times. So muscles of the rotator cuff largely arise from these areas on top of the scapula that are created by some of those uh, primary features we discussed earlier. So those are the landmarks. Now, what I want to talk about quickly is 
how these are secured. How is the girdle secured? We have one point of attachment, the sternoclavicular joint. How does the clavicle attach to the scapula, and how do we make sure that that joint is secure? It's heavily knitted together with ligaments. Let's take a look at some of the uh, supporting structures. There aren't muscles that bridge this space. This is uh, <coughs> ligament territory. You can see the, uh, the clavicle cut through that would project towards the sternum. Just behind, you can see the acromion and the coracoid process, those two features that we, uh, we discussed uh, as primary features of the scapula. And here, again, the names of these ligaments are going to tell you what they connect. The first half, the second half tells you what the ligaments connect. And the obvious first ligament that you can see that connects the acromion of the scapula and the clavicle is the acromioclavicular ligament. Acromion clavicle. If I asked you, for instance, the, uh, the ligaments that secure the shoulder girdle, this would be a list of ligaments that you might want to remember for a question like that. The acromioclavicular ligament attaches and secures the acromion to the clavicle. What's well, part of the supportive structure but isn't really part of the joint, the joint that secures the girdle in place, because really it's a, it's a ligament that spans two pieces of the same bone, is the coracoacromial ligament. Both of those features are part of the scapula. There is a ligament that bridges the space between them, and it plays a supportive and divisive role. So um, it helps to secure some of the, the bursa, which you can see here that I haven't pointed out yet. Um, the bursa, the supportive features of the joint that help keep uh, friction down and uh, keep the joint structure intact. This isn't securing the girdle proper, but it helps to provide support and uh, divide different structures that move across the joint. So the coracoacromial ligament is the second major identifiable ligament. And the last, if you're keeping track, there's three, happens to be broken into two parts. The coracoclavicular ligament, made of two ligaments, one of which attaches to the conoid process clavicle, that bumpy point on the underside of the clavicle that is specifically brought up when we introduce that bone, this is where it has its time to shine. The conoid tubercle allows attachment of the conoid ligament to the coracoid process. Conoid tubercle, conoid ligament, same, uh, same name. This diagram separates the two, so they look like two distinct ligaments, but often in practice, if you see this in the wild or in the body, so to speak, this often merges with the second ligament, the trapezoid ligament. These two things together look like a sheet of connective tissue that span the surface between the clavicle and the coracoid process, really anchoring, not just securing at the joint proper, but anchoring the surface of the clavicle to the coracoid process of the scapula. So many different attachment points, three different attachment points for the clavicle and the scapula to, uh, to secure that joint, secure the shoulder girdle. What else is interesting? It's not clear why this next uh, feature is interesting yet. It will become clear later, again, as we talk about the rotator cuff. But I want to point out while we're here the suprascapular ligament. And if you look in the book, it's sometimes, depending on where you look, it might be referred to as the superior transverse scapular ligament, um, which does really describe what it does. It's also known a bit more affectionately as just the suprascapular yeah. ligament. It's a ligament on top of or supra above the scapula that bridges this really small divot or a notch. The suprascapular ligament bridges the suprascapular notch. 
And this notch is really interesting, not for its physical structure or any support or points of attachment. It's really interesting for the paths that arteries and nerves take from posterior to the anterior surface of the scapula. The ligament divides the path of the vein, artery, and nerve. And we're going to come back to that. I just want to introduce that to you here while we see this structure without anything else that's confusing it. So the suprascapular ligament bridges the suprascapular notch. It's a landmark for when you're in the body, and we can uh, see how things travel in relation to the ligament. So, without going in depth of the bones in the upper limb, I want to look just at the attachments of the girdle first. These are the bones of the girdle. This is the, the scaffolding, the infrastructure of the girdle. Now, how does that move in relation to the axial skeleton? What muscles secure the girdle in place? We've only seen one point of bone-on-bone -bone attachment. There must be some large muscles, one of them's highlighted here, that helps to secure the shoulder girdle and keep it uh, pinned close to the body and prevent it from being extruded or extracted unnecessarily. So I'm moving forward with um, uh, a, a broad-ish view that I'll compart compartmentalize in three ways. I'm looking at anterior, posterior, and superior muscles. And I'm just looking at muscles that bridge the axial skeleton or the thoracic cage and the shoulder girdle. How is it that the two bones that attach at one point are secured in place to the axial skeleton? What we see on the anterior surface is the first major point of attachment. We've removed a few of the superficial muscles on the front of the body because they don't secure the girdle to the body. We'll come back to uh, some of the larger muscles on the front of the body shortly. But the first muscle you'll notice that secures part of the shoulder girdle to the thoracic cage is pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor muscle. Minor is a, a suffix that's usually used in pairs, major and minor. So this could be interpreted as one of two pectoralis muscles, and it is. You're not looking at the other pectoralis muscle here. It's not even available to be seen on this slide uh, because it's not part of the musculature that secures the shoulder girdle. <laughs> pectoralis minor. Attaches to uh, ribs three, four, five. And if you remember the brachial plexus song, we're going to touch, uh, touch on the brachial plexus song a few times as we go through these muscles. We're not going to touch on blood supply right now. I only want you to know that the medial, um, the medial pector, uh, pectoral nerve is what innervates pectoralis minor. And if you ever see this in a cadaver or a... Um, uh, a real body for whatever, uh, whatever reason, if you're looking at pec minor in a real body. This is one of the only situations where the nerve supplying the muscle pierces that muscle. Normally, a nerve will branch out and then attach to, and that's it. There will be a junction, it will send signals to activate the muscle, and that's it. But this is one of the only situations where we've observed the medial pec nerve, it pierces the muscle belly. It runs from the posterior to the anterior surface. It pierces the muscle belly and innervates it while piercing it. I haven't shown it to you here because it would be complicated with all the nerves, but this is one of the only situations where that happens. All told, this is a fairly small muscle connects the coracoid process, some anterior ribs, and it doesn't look like it has the substance to secure the shoulder girdle in the face of large forces. Larger muscles are needed to generate large forces to secure the shoulder girdle. <laughs> 
we get a glimpse of one of those muscles as we look around the sides of the thoracic cage. Serratus anterior. The name so given because the front leading edge of the muscle looks to have a serrated saw blade appearance when viewed from, um, uh, from the surface. And some people more than others. We're all lamenting the fact, oh, not in us. I certainly am. Serratus anterior is that saw blade muscle that runs around the, uh, the anterior lateral portion of the thoracic cavity when it's well developed or you are a uh, lucky person with less than 5% body fat. Serratus anterior obviously connects to the thoracic cage, but where does it attach to the, the shoulder girdle? If you followed this muscle all the way around and you can kind of see through the thoracic cage here, it wraps all the way around the thoracic cage and attaches to the medial border of the scapula. So think about that, the medial border. Not the lateral, the medial border. It connects near the spine. So it wraps around the thoracic cage under the shoulder blade, and then attaches to the medial border close to the spinal cord. So the scapula would sit, well, you can see, the scapula sits posterior to the serratus anterior muscle. It wraps all the way around and tries to hug the thoracic cage. It's large. It covers a long portion of the thoracic cavity. As such, innervated by the long thoracic nerve. Long thoracic, formed by C5 to 7. By now, you should be in BP heaven. Yeah. And those snippets are going to come back really quickly. Dorsal scapula runs off of C5. Oh, actually, that's coming up right now. What other muscle on this slide helps to anchor the shoulder girdle? Anchor the scapula. Anchor, uh, anchor the clavicle. not the clavicle, anchor the scapula, the uh, levator scapula for its actions of lifting, levator, uh, what's that in French, levé, lift the scapula. Levator scapula is the one where when you hang your head forward and then turn to the side, you can feel it pulling. The one that's always really tight and really painful not just pointing forward, but then turn to the side. Levator, le, levator scap smells like crap. because so you're essentially smelling your armpit. That's the muscle you're stretching when you do that motion. Levator scap connects the cervical vertebrae, the transverse processes of the, the cervical vertebrae, C2, C3, C4, to the uh, superior angle of the scapula. Let's just call it the medial border, the top of the medial border of the scapula. What does it do? It lifts up the medial border of the scapula. Dorsal scapular comes up, C5. We're going to come back to dorsal scapular when we get to the back. Dorsal, posterior, scapular. We'll see that uh, a couple more times. So three muscles that we can see here. I'm only showing you levator scapula because it's easy to see from the front. It actually arises from the scapula posterior, behind the slide. It is a posterior muscle, but it's easy to see from the front because there are a few structures that get in the way. You'll see that coming up later, um, how far posterior it goes in the, in the body. Is that you? <laughs> Let it play. It's fine. Of all the people, one of the authority figures in class didn't turn her ringer off. That's terrible. I better make sure that mine's off now. All right. Let's, uh, let's round up the muscles that secure the shoulder girdle, and then we'll call it for the day.
Muscles that sec uh, secure the shoulder girdle. One is conspicuously absent from this picture, and there aren't many good pictures, at least in the, uh, the series of slides that I made for last year. So I've superimposed one of the most obvious upper back shoulder girdle muscles up here on the left-hand side. Trapezius. Trapezius covers all the cervical vertebrae through the thoracic vertebrae and then spans the entire length of the spine of the scapula, attaching to parts of the clavicle. So this big meaty muscle that you feel superficial, that's trapezius. Trapezius, innervated directly by a cranial nerve. One of the only muscles in the upper body or in the, in the thorax that's innervated directly by a cranial nerve. I learned it as the spinal accessory nerve. That's why I have spinal in brackets. You learned it as accessory. Oh, 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 to touch and feel. Very green vegetables. Ah, heaven. Accessory. Long-winded. So the accessory nerve, cranial nerve uh, 11, innervates directly trapezius, which has conveniently been removed from the diagram in behind but has a major role in securing uh, the shoulder girdle. It attaches the length of the spine of the scapula and provides many attachment points along the spinous processes of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. Let's just take a moment to appreciate. Remember how we talked about you're learning a new, a new language and all the words you had to learn? We talked about lateral, medial, superior, inferior, way back in week one. And here I'm rhyming off, attaching the length of the spine of the scapula and the spinous processes of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Or is that wishful thinking? I imagine that you're saying that. I imagine that all these dissatisfied faces that are half falling asleep are so far ahead of the curve. They don't need to pay attention. Yeah, okay. So if we remove the trapezius, which is the most obvious uh, dorsal muscle that secures the shoulder girdle, we reveal a couple, uh, a couple smaller players. And these smaller players are named for their shape. They are rhomboid in shape. They're a bent square in shape. And so we call them the rhomboid muscles, rhomboid major, under minor, also innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. Rhomboid major under minor is the lyric in song number two that I keep singing. You don't know it yet, but we're going to get to that later. Rhomboid major under minor has dorsal scapular, hard to find her. These don't have separate actions. They are separate muscle bellies, and they're so named for their relative size. The suffix major and minor usually means bigger and smaller. Rhomboid major is larger than rhomboid minor. We saw pec, uh, pectoralis minor earlier. You can imagine pectoralis major would be bigger, and you'd be right. So the suffix is just the relative size of these two muscles. And they attach the length of the medial border of the scapula. Rhomboid major attaches below the level of the spine of the scapula. And rhomboid minor attaches to the medial border at the level of the spine of the scapula. Both of those innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve, the nerve on the back of the scapula, just like our old friend levator scapulae, which you can now see here, attached to the superior part of the medial border of the scapula. So it doesn't attach in the neck like it looked like on the last slide. It actually arises in the top uh, superior portion of the scapula. You can feel it on your upper back uh, if you push through your trapezius hard enough. For me, that's one of the areas that's always knotted. Always knotted. And it's terrible. If you can, don't grow old. It's, it's uh, crappy. So... What I want to do is reframe the material that we've looked at so far, not as a list of muscles and nerves and list of bones, but rather um, in the form of a question. I'm going to pose a question to you and a question to myself as I review. 
how is the upper limb, or maybe more specifically, how is the shoulder girdle attached to the body? And this sets the stage for um, an exercise or two that I want to do as we get later on into this week. And I, I appreciate that listing bones and muscles and nerves can just be exhaustive. And it's one thing after another, and it's hard to keep them straight. So we're going to go through this, and we're going to look at the shoulder joint in class on Thursday. And then I think what I want to do is have you work through an exercise where I just ask you, how do you um, lift a dumbbell? How do you do a, dumb, a dumbbell curl? And I want you to go through the bones, muscles, nerves, structures that support and allow you to perform that action. Uh, the muscles that grip the dumbbell, that uh, contract the forearm, that flex the elbow. I want you to go through that. And all the, all the answers are in the slide set already. But I want to pose it to you as a question instead. So for the upper limb, for the shoulder girdle, the foundation of the shoulder girdle is the clavicle and scapula. They attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton. How do they attach the upper limb, and how are they themselves attached? The only points of attachment of these two bones are the sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular joints. Two points of attachment for two bones of the shoulder girdle that secure or uh, support the upper limb. Now those two bones don't just meet at those two, or they do only meet at those two points, but they're secured in a couple different places. They're secured by three ligaments. And if you want to break that third one up into its two constituents, you could say four. Remember that name of the, the ligament? Conoid ligament. Trapezoid ligament made up to be made up of something ligament. Figure it out. Uh, so a series of ligaments: the acromioclavicular, conoid, trapezoid, um, coracoacromio, which is not really part of the joint itself, but just spanning two parts of the same bone. Those four ligaments help to secure the shoulder girdle. And the shoulder girdle is attached by muscles in various compartments, anteriorly, pec minor, absolutely, posteriorly, both rhomboids, and I'm going to say trapezius, uh, superiorly, trapezius, and levator scapulae. And then it would be a good exercise to go through and uh, think about what nerves innervate these muscles. For instance, the posterior-ish group the medial border of the scapula group, all dorsal scapular nerve. And if I were to point those out to you on this slide, that would be this small grouping of three muscles down here, all dorsal scapular nerve. Trapezius we saw was really interesting. It's uh, one that's innervated by a cranial nerve, the serratus anterior, long muscle spanning a lot of thoracic cage, long thoracic nerve, and pectoralis minor pierced by the medial pec nerve. So it is the same information, repackaged in a slightly different way, but it's a list of these are the uh, these are supportive features, this is how they're supported, how they're secured, and the muscles that then articulate those those features. So when we get back to class on Thursday, we're doing the same thing for the shoulder. The problem joint of the body. The loosest ball and socket, the most prone to separation. You're not going to feel bad for me. I'm just going to feel bad for myself as we go through that discussion. So have a great Tuesday. See you um, later on Thursday afternoon.